Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. There is so much going on in Washington, and we thought we'd spend some time with a guy who's been around the block there um, for many years since uh, first elected to the district in um, 2002. Congressman Trent Franks is our guest this week on Newsmaker Sunday, represents Arizona's 8th district, which is the suburbs north and west of Phoenix and in Maricopa County. Yes, Good to sir. see you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. It's, it's good to see you, and we've, we've got so much to talk about. And let's start with the tax vote on Thursday. Yes, sir. The big tax cut. The president calls it the biggest tax cut in 30 years since Ronald Reagan, 1980, what, 82, 80 something? Well, there's no question that he's, he's accurate on that. You know, I have to say, I think it was a very good day for America. And I've been optimistic uh, on this, even though I know I've probably been someone that's railed against some of the Senate rules making it almost impossible for us to do anything, like Obamacare is a perfect example. I mean, we repealed in the House, repealed and replaced Obamacare 43 times. No, I know. Uh, and then when it came to actually doing it, everybody thought, why didn't you do it? Well, it was because we were trying to get it through that Senate matrix of the, the Byrd Rule and Reconciliation, which is, I know, esoteric, but we had to try to shape it. It was very hard to do. To get your to, votes you needed. To get it to the Senate yeah. floor. So. Right. So uh, the, the difference is with the tax bill that uh, the, the bird rule allows you to have a little bit more lateral negotiating capability when it is something that affects the budget or the taxes. And that means we have a real shot here. The planets are kind of lining up. Uh, and I think we have a, a profound opportunity to write something that will catalyze an economic uh, surge in this country that could truly be something of, of great consequence. There, there are still, as you know, uh, and now it's in the Senate, and there are, and they're going, they're going to introduce their own bill. There will be some kind of reconciliation, I would assume, at the end of this. But you've already got six no's in the Senate. I know that's not your business because you're in the House. Um, Johnson uh, from Wisconsin, he's one of the senators. McCain, Flake from Arizona, Corker. Some of these people have personal. Um, animus toward the president, I think, is safe to say. Do you worry that that could really gum up this thing because of how certain people feel about President Trump? Well, I, in, in one sense, I guess I do, John, but I'm hoping that any of those names that you mentioned will take a statesman's view and, and look to the, to the best of the country rather than let any grudge uh, uh, be the, you the know compelling. two of them very well because you're in you you represent Arizona and they do too Flake and McCain. But you know I, I will I'll make a prediction here and I and I may be just as wrong as I can be. You'll have it on tape later. You can prove it one way or the other. But uh, I don't, I don't want to be you know cowardly here. I think that Senator McCain and Senator Flake will end up voting for this package not because they're just happy with uh, the president, but because they see that this is a uh, the statesman's thing to do for the sake of the country for their children and your children and mine. I think I think. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, you know, you can play this tape, tape and have a good laugh. Well, hey, listen, we're, we're, we're wrong all the time, and, and we certainly are in the media. Let, let's listen to Senator Johnson, uh, who's already gone on the record saying right now he would be a no. Take a listen. I wouldn't vote for it. It's just that simple, but doesn't mean I don't want to, you know, vote for a, a real solution. And so that's why I work with, uh, you know, again, Senate, House, and the White House to get one. Okay, so that's uh, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, and again, you know, this this was already already going to be tight in the Senate, but well, the big point of contention is that you know that could complicate things is whether to appeal the Obamacare provision. Well, let me say something first, if I could, about Ron Johnson. First of all, he is such a decent guy. He's a good man. He's very smart. He's a former businessman. You know, I'm a former CEO. And right. This guy is really a bright guy, and I think that what I hear there uh, is some very important uh, effort to negotiate some changes in the bill. And I think he's basically right on. And I think that maybe his effort will, will make the bill a little better bill. I'm, I, I voted for the bill. I absolutely am 100% for it. Uh, are there things that I would change in it? Absolutely, mm -hmm. John. But overall, the, the, the bill is a good bill. And I think that when Ron gets through here, I think at the end we'll see Ron Johnson vote for this bill. What is, what is, we'll get to the spending part of this in a minute, but what is the biggest benefit of this tax cut? I think the biggest benefit, even though it's sold as allowing people to keep more of their money, which is great, and that's going to help a lot of people in a very real, tangible, palpable way, the big one is it's going to cause, uh, I believe, a tremendous surge in the economy, which is going to raise our productivity. And uh, really, an economy is measured on its productivity. That's the way that we should measure all economy. And uh, a nation that has a productive economy can afford a defense apparatus, can afford 
uh, a, a government apparatus to do other things of consequence. And uh, I, uh, I'm just truly convinced that when the American people see the final result here, like you saw in the Reagan years, you know, where you had tremendous growth, mm -hmm. to me that's the big issue. And that's going to help every corner, every sector of society. You would call yourself a deficit hawk, right? I am, yes. Okay, does the $1.5 trillion price tag on this cut, this is one of the things Jeff Flake has mentioned. Yep. Does it well, worry Of you? course it does. And the thing that I, I respond to, though, is that they, these are numbers given by CBO and others that don't take into account true dynamic scoring. And by that, I mean they, they sort of say, okay, everything's going to be the same. And when you see a resurgence in the economy, when you see growth, uh, that rising tide yeah. lifts all boats, and I would truly suggest that this bill is ultimately going to be better for the deficit, not worse for it. Interesting. Yeah. Why are we not having a discussion? Paul Ryan's a speaker. Paul Ryan was probably the, the best versed in the House on the deficit yeah. and debt issue. Why are we not having a conversation about controlling spending in Washington? Well, there's a reason, and, and we should be uh, having it much more, but we have uh, a rule construct in the Senate that it requires 60 votes to get a bill to the floor. And uh, my friends on the left, you know, are now all of a sudden saying that... Uh, it's that this not tax deficit neutral. It's not, yeah, they're going to... All of a sudden they're saying this could add to the deficit. And that represents essentially the first time in the history of human civilization that they've ever been concerned about the deficit. But they're using that uh, a great deal now. Uh, but the, the, the problem is in the Senate, when we have to have 60 votes to bring a bill to the floor, Democrats... Uh, who don't have an eye on the deficit in real terms are able to stop almost anything that doesn't represent what they want from coming to the floor. And so we get slow walked into bankruptcy here. They're able to maintain, if we're not in control, we have no control over the, of the debt issue, or spending in, and uh, versus uh, revenue. But my and goodness, if we are, you've got the are able, House and you've got the Senate and you've got the it's, White House. It's the most maddening thing in the world. It's the greatest untold secret. I hope some people go on the Hill, uh, thehill.com, that's a newspaper on Capitol Hill, and find an article that I wrote called The Tyranny of the Filibuster under my name, Trent Franks. And it will absolutely illuminate uh, their minds as to why we have such a hard time getting anything done. The House almost always gets their work done. We, we, uh, we repealed Obamacare 43 times, and the Senate couldn't do it once. Uh, we, we passed this tax bill fairly easy by 227 votes. And obviously the challenge is what are we doing? In the, in you the, believe in the end, though, it will, it will get done. I believe the tax bill will get done, but then all of a sudden we're going to be facing uh, the uh, appropriations process where that 60-vote right. filibuster to get something to the floor will have enormous leverage in the hands of Democrats that don't want us to do anything of consequence in that area. Okay, let's get into uh, some of the ugliness going on okay. in Washington. Can you roll tape number three? This is uh, Senator Al Franken, the latest of... Yeah. How much of this stuff is going on in D.C.? Yeah. How much of this philandering and just uh, bad behavior is going on? Have you seen it? You've been there 15 years. Well, obviously, I've uh, witnessed uh, a lot of different things. And, of course, when these things become public, everyone in, in, in Washington knows about it. This happened, by the way, before uh, Al Franken was a senator, right, obviously. Right. This is when he was an entertainer, primarily. Yeah. But. And the only thing I would say to you, you know, um, that this Al Franken thing, I, I, I saw the picture. And it looks like he's being, because I think Al Franken is such an empty suit. You understand that. I think that he is really, uh, and I, I say that charitably, because I'm about to say something somewhat that ameliorates his issue. Um, I think, you know, it looked like he was look, posing for that picture. And it looks like it was just another tasteless, stupid prank of Al Franken. And I don't think he belongs in the U.S. Senate. I've made that very clear. But I'm not sure that it's portrayed exactly as it is. As, as, as was it completely and totally tasteless and inappropriate? Yes, it was. Was, uh, was it, uh, as it's portrayed, uh, uh, sexual assault? Uh, I don't think I, I would characterize it some of this. Some of this is very, I mean, you're getting into almost some yeah, kind of trying to gray cut, areas. Yeah, you are. Okay, well, this is equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, roll tape number four. What do you know about this Roy Moore? And I, does I, this I, guy I, I belong Roy in the Moore U.S. Once, Senate? And obviously, I hold to, to the exact same position that the president took here. This, yeah. this is Roy, a yearbook Roy's, that he apparently signed to this young girl. Yeah, Roy Moore is the one who knows the truth. And if these allegations against him are true, he should say, I'm stepping aside and I'm stepping out of it. If they're not true, then he has to fight on. And, and I, I wish I could express to you uh, confidently which of those things are, are the reality. Since you've been around there, 
How many more shoes are going to fall in Washington on this kind of stuff? Oh, John, there, there's, there's three kinds of people that predict what's going to happen in Washington. Those who don't know, those who don't know they don't know, and those who know they don't know. And I would fit in that final category. Uh, so you can I, put the media in there, yeah, too, yeah. Uh, Congressman, I'm sure. Yes, <laughs> All right, let, let's talk about a couple of things. Um, I was looking at your record. Um, you are the third most conservative in the U.S. House of Representatives who have served 10 years or more. Is that right? Do you well, wear I'm, that I'm as a, little, a... I'm a little shocked that, it's, that I'm third. <laughs> of, you know, no, I don't <laughs> say that out of... There's are you no going for... Arrogance. You're going no, for no. one? I never try to vote based on what the... the it's just know, the, where you are. Yeah, I really... Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic. Sometimes they look at people like me and they say, well, you're too conservative because the difference is for me, you know, some people are conservative on fiscal issues, some on defense, some on constitutional issues. And I pretty much am a full-spectrum conservative across the board, and that's why my numbers rate so, so highly. But in, in truth, uh, you know, I'm a Republican, and if you look at the Republican plat platform, uh, I would dare someone to find where I voted uh, counter to that, you know, antithetical to, the, to any major component of the Republican plat platform. The difference is we all talk like Republicans. We all say we're conservative, but when the pressure's on, uh, we don't always vote that way. And in, in my case, I generally vote like I talk, and, and I try to. And so that's, that's the, the, really the situation, I think. But the point is, in your district, you were reelected by how much of a margin last time well, around? Well, no, they're really good. You know, I love my district. I, I try to represent them like they were my own family. And sometimes, you know, like families, if you, uh, if you disagree sometimes, that's just natural. But you still love each other, and you still want to try to do the best for each other. And I want to try to do the very best for every person in my district, no matter how old, what color, how, uh, you know, how wealthy they are, whether they're Democrat, Independent, uh, or Republican, they know that. And they, a lot of them don't agree with me, but they know that I'm trying to do what I think but is truly right But the point is, you won... And I think that's why I get such high numbers. It, exactly. It was, what, what was it, 70-some percent? Well, I think it might have been less than 70, but it was very high. <clears throat> okay, so, so you're in step, generally, with those people, obviously, with the people in your district. Well, and, you know, I give them the credit, not me, because uh, they, uh, they've stuck with me. They know that, you know, when I get pounded or something like that from someone on the left, they, they just say, no, you know, Trent really believes that stuff, and he, he's going to continue to vote that way, and, and, and I vote exactly like I tell him I'm going to. Let me roll tape number seven. Okay. I had Jeff Flake, mm -hmm. senator on the program. Um, are you going to run for this seat? No, I'm not going to run for the, for Lake, the Flake seat. Uh, I, I've made that pretty clear. Um, you know, we'll see what happens going forward in, in future years or, or whatever the, the time might be, but um, I'm not going to run for this one. You know, I'm a senior member of the House, and, and uh, uh, I'm doing some things that I think are very important, and I think it's kind of, a, you know, the whole situation is sort of an unfortunate uh, development. Uh, I, I have had some profound disagreements with Jeff Flake and, and have criticized him publicly for, you know, potentially uh, assisting Hillary Clinton, even though you know, that may not have been his intent. I think that that was the in effect. In the presidential election. Yeah, I think that was the effect. So I've been very hard on him in that regard. But the bottom line is this. I believe deeply in my heart that Jeff Flake is a decent human being that loves God, that loves America, that loves his family, and loves his fellow human beings. And regardless of how I disagree with him uh, on some political things, I, I think that's the essence of the man. And I think it's too bad that he kind of got so... Uh, crosswise uh, here with the, with the state uh, because he's why do you think that happened congressman what what happened oh. with jeff flake well uh you know he's like a lot of us there's a, there's an old saying that it's better to stand in the way of an entire army than one calvinist who believes he's doing the will of god now i'm not saying that jeff is a calvinist he would probably take issue with that but the 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 the, the point is that sometimes when a person thinks he's right uh he has a responsibility to 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 see that through and i think that's what jeff has tried to do now i I think in many instances, in the majority of these instances that have been such high profile issue, I think he's wrong. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't respect him for trying to, to hold forth what he believes and sticking with it. Um, I, it's, it's hard to add a lot to that, John. You yeah, know, because I, I, it's just interesting. You know, when he, when he was first elected, I thought this, this is a guy who probably will have a pretty long tenure in the U.S. Yeah. Senate. Well, I, I did too. And, and I hope that. Uh, somehow that he moves on to some areas that are productive because he's a he's a very very do you think he changed man. um 
Do you, I mean, the, we had this discussion about whether the party left him or he kind of left the party. Yeah, and well, he still I, says I think, he's a Republican. Yeah, and he is a Republican. Uh, I think that uh, he's got a strong libertarian streak through him, and, uh, and I respect that. I've got a little bit of it, too. Uh, but I would think if you look to the people who have found disagreement with him, uh, they've stayed the same, and, and Jeff stepped in a different direction. Now, maybe someday we will uh, recognize that he saw something that we didn't, or maybe vice versa. Uh, I will just say to you, when it comes to Donald Trump, I think, you know, I, I can't gain by what I'm about to say. When I was in the primary, I didn't support Donald Trump. Right. I, was I, a, remember. I was a Mike Huckabee guy. Right. Uh, but when Donald Trump won that nomination, I became one of his strongest supporters because I knew the binary alternative was Hillary Clinton that would appoint Supreme Court justices that would destroy our Constitution. And I, I'm being very direct now. It sounds very polarized. It sounds very uh, partisan. But I believe Hillary Clinton would have done unmitigated damage to this country. And so, therefore, I could not possibly fathom why someone would do anything to strengthen her chances of winning. And I called them out strongly on that. So, you know, I, I hope I'm not being disingenuous here. I mean, does Donald Trump speak uh, diplomat? No, he doesn't. And does he say some outrageous things at times? Yes, he does. And, and I, I wish he didn't. But if you look at what the man's doing, if you look at the appointments like Mike Pence, one of the greatest statesmen in America, uh, that I hope will be yeah, the I'm next sure president. I'm sure you knew him well in the I, House. He, was, he and I were close friends for 10 years in the House. And this is a truly great man that has all of the accoutrements of what statesmanship really should be all about. And Donald Trump appointed him vice president. That's significant leadership. Gorsuch was one of the best Supreme Court justices that's been appointed in the last 50 to 100 years to the Supreme Court. So if you look at what Donald Trump is doing, uh, and, and get past to the way sometimes he might present it, uh, then, then it's, it's not so hard. And I've grown to know him more, too. So I, I just think the guy is, is kind of was God's rescue to America. That, that's interesting. I, I've got I've to throw one more out here since we're on the subject sure. of Trump. You called for Robert Mueller, the special counsel, that he must resign. You, I, I, you think that this thing has gone way beyond the scope of what it was intended and that it hasn't been handled well, in your view. Well, I did, and I, I predicted that that's what would happen without, you know, there, there's no arrogance in that. It's just that... Uh, Special counsels tend to get a little bit out of control. Almost always run off the, the rail, especially if they can't find what their original... Uh, I mean, Ken Starr started with Whitewater and ended up with Monica Lewinsky. Yeah, that's my point. So you just never know where this is going to go. And it should be very specific, and there should be very clear probable cause, and there wasn't in this case. Uh, he has had an enormous diff difficult time in trying to come up with some sort of absolute clear evidence that the Trump campaign illegally colluded with Russia uh, on the election. I just don't, I've not seen any evidence of that. On but is other, it possible that's exactly what he's going to find? Uh, I, think what he, I think what he's going to find, if he, if he follows through, he's going to find that the Democrats colluded with Russia. I mean, you look at the... The, the dossier the, and the, all the of that. The dossier, you look yeah. at uh, uh, the, uh, the Uranium One deal. The Uranium One deal, in, in simple terms, the Uranium One deal... Um, after knowing that Russia was deliberately bribing people and criminal activity to try to gain a stake in an America's uranium production business or industry. The FBI knew that. Robert Mueller was the head of the FBI at that time. They knew that. And yet that deal still went through without it being stopped. And in the process, the same month that it went through, Bill Clinton got a half a million dollars for one speaking engagement. I didn't think he was that good. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the head of, uh, of Uranium One, the, the, the chairman there, gave the uh, Clinton Foundation $2.35 million, and the shareholders, the shareholders of Uranium One gave the Clinton Foundation $145 million. Now, if that kind of evidence was against Trump right now, they would have burned him at stake in front of the White House. And it's astonishing to me that somehow we look to, you know, this great grand... Uh, uh, scandal that, that Donald Trump uh, had some sort of connection to the Russians and you that they all colluded. I don't see any illegal collusion there whatsoever. We're gonna, and yet the, the, the evidence uh, is massive on the other side. We're going to take a quick break. Representative Trent Franks, Arizona's 8th Congressional District. He's been serving since 2002. When we come back, we've got so much still to cover. Uh, we'll get to it. We're going to talk about several things, including North Korea, uh, Joe Arpaio, who you wanted to see pardoned, and um, the spate of shootings we've had around the country. Back in a minute with Congressman Trent Franks.
Back with Arizona Congressman Trent Franks from Arizona's District 8, and that is, uh, in case you, you've got your map out, it's the suburbs north and west of Phoenix in Maricopa County. Um, it's not as unwieldy as your old district was, mm -hmm. not quite as, as large. Let's roll some video of the president. We talked about him a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. You think, even though, um, and I talked to Jeff Flake about this same thing, tonality is sometimes troubling. Fair to say, but you think on the big issues, his instincts are right. I think he has done very well on what he's actually done, and whatever criticism that anyone might make of his presentation or how he verbally uh, expresses himself, you have to you have to suggest that somehow the guy might be just uncivilized enough to do what the country really needs, and and I he say was that the as, I say ball, that as a, yeah. yeah I say that as a compliment to him because I think sometimes you know if we get get somebody that's too genteel or, or, or just too uh, politically nice. correct or just, you know, it's, I think nice is a good thing to be. Uh, I, I hope timid? we all are timid. Yeah, I don't think he's timid. I think one no. of the reasons he got elected is because people were tired of government not doing what they needed to do and they wanted somebody to belt government in the mouth and he seemed perfectly willing to proceed. In that, in that flake race, who do you believe ultimately prevails? You've worked with Kirsten Sinema. She is a yeah. very... Um, she is a very dynamic politician. She, there's no question about it, and she's a nice person. Uh, I will say that I believe that some of her record uh, in legislative days will be very telling, because when she got to Congress, she began to, to sort of move to the center. But she's right uh, in the center. Yeah, and she really isn't right in the center. She's so far to the left, she's about to fall off the edge. But uh, I think that her voting record reflects a center uh, right uh, or center left uh, uh, perspective because she knew that she might run for that. And I say that without any personal uh, dig at her. I just think that she's far more to the left than anybody dreams. Let, let, me, uh, let me run tape number 10. This is the uh, shooting in Las Vegas, yeah. the Texas church yes, shooting sir. three weeks ago. Um, on this issue of, of, you know, we always get into this debate. Is there anything that any laws or any regulations mm -hmm. could have done? Your NRA uh, approval rating is 93%. Your rating with the NRA. 90% with the gun owners of America. I just wonder where the other 7 and 10% went. <laughs> what is there anything that Congress can do to stop this kind of stuff? Everybody wants yeah. Congress. Sure. You know, they, when something happens, they say, there's got to be some way to stop this. Yeah. I am not sure there is. Well, I think that first and foremost, we have to ask what causes it. And I am convinced that it's not the guns that have caused it. I am convinced that it's, it's either mental illness or malevolence or just plain sheer damn evil that causes these things. If you look at terrorism, 80% of the time they do not use a gun. They use you know, pressure cookers or trucks or explosives or knives. And we fundamentally have to try to get to the core issue of how someone feels justified to murder the innocent. And if we don't somehow, in, 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 as a society, raise a higher standard that somehow there has to be a moral impulse that we have to care about each other and see each other as brothers and sisters. That may sound all pie in the sky, but if we don't do that, these things will continue. We've got to take a quick break, one more quick break, and we're back. Final thoughts with uh, Arizona Congressman Trent Franks from District 8. Back in a moment. Final moments with Arizona Congressman Trent Franks, Republican from Arizona's 8th District. Let's take a look at uh, tape number nine. You were one of the ones who early on called on the president to uh, pardon Joe Arpaio. That yeah. happened. Yeah. He wanted the entire thing expunged from his record that he had been convicted of this um, in federal court. How do you think this all worked out? Well, I think it worked out about right. I, I think that uh, the Obama Justice Department deliberately pursued a political vendetta against Joe. I think they, they may have had things that, that were... Um, appropriate to question him on, but they, they deliberately, I think, defaulted to a political witch hunt, and so I was very thankful the president had the courage to do what he did. We've got 30 seconds. Um, should, this is a really tough subject to get into, but should Senator McCain's seat open up? Would you run for that seat? Uh, you know, I can't, I can't speak to that. Right now, I pray that Senator McCain uh, is com completely recovers and serves out his term and uh, is able to step away from this on his own terms. He has certainly given great uh, service to this country, and I wish him everything God can give him that's good. Congressman, good to see you. Thank you, Trent sir. Franks, uh, this week on Newsmaker Sunday. Thanks again. Thank you. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday.